the German Darwin, Heiko. A couple of years after Darwin's theory was published in 1859, Heiko came up with a theory of everything. We love theories of everything today, don't we? Well, Heiko was very good at that. And what he wanted to do was he wanted to join together this new theory of evolution by natural selection with development. In other words, what happened from the egg through the embryo to the adult? How do they join together? Can you have a theory of everything? And Heiko came up with it, called it his biogen biogenetic theory. And the biogenetic theory said that evolution occurred by an animal reliving its evolutionary history through the, larv through the embryonic and larval stages. And then at the end, it would add on a new bit. It was called terminal addition. So evolution happened, if you like, at the end, you added something on. So here we have, on your left-hand side, we've got a fish. The fish embryo at the top, top left-hand side, and as you go down, it turns in through development to an adult fish. And then you look side by side here, um, on the right-hand side, you have a human embryo. And, and, and in Heiko's view, what the human was doing in the womb was it was reliving its evolutionary history. So at the top, you see it's, that's its fish stage. And then, but finally, you've got another bit added on which makes it human. So human being is really just all of the evolutionary history and at the end of it, you add on the bit called human. Now, that's a great story. That's a fantastic story, and it accords with so much of psychology, of myth, of the, the way the Greeks told things. It's a great story. The problem with it is evolution doesn't play Jenga. Or it does it. You see, because... What we have here, this is a game of Jenga. I don't know if you've ever played this. Quite a dangerous game when you're playing at this scale. And what Fiona's just done is she's taken some stuff from the bottom and was going to try and put it on top, and she never got there. She got the stuff from the bottom, and it all fell apart. Well, in Heiko's view, that's the way development works, that you can't go to the very early stages and start mucking them around because the whole thing will fall apart. So if you want to add something, you have to just add it on top. So evolution doesn't play Jenga, according to this view of Heiko. His view is called recapitulation, the fact that you live through your you know, sort of evolutionary history, and then there's a bit added on at the end, which makes you who you are. Very, very attractive, and it says that evolution doesn't play Jenga. So it sort of makes sense, doesn't it? That, I mean, from an egg, two cells, four cells, and all that, you're not going to muck around with that. You muck around with the stuff later on, in terms of evolution and adaptation to the environment. That's Heiko's view. The interesting thing was that it doesn't work. And it was shown 20 or 30 years after Heiko that where people started to say, well, but hold on, but natural selection, the way that evolution works, actually can work at any stage of development. It doesn't have to just be at the end. It could be any stage. People said that, and still in the textbooks, this idea of recapitulation came up time and time and time again. Even here in Plymouth, Walter Garstang, who was at the Marine Biology Association, he despised the idea simply because, as a marine biologist, who of course know far more than most other biologists, in terms of the breadth of the animal kingdom, careful, just in terms of the breadth of the animal kingdom, knows fine well that if you look at all the animals that live in the sea, they, they undergo quite complex life cycles. And the idea that those creatures are reliving their evolutionary history just seems a nonsense because even the earliest stages are adapted to what they're seeing at that particular time, and you can have huge adaptation. And he used a, a very, very old-fashioned uh, multimedia technique called chalk, and he would stand in front of his class, and he would draw the different stages and show his, his, his students that recapitulation didn't work. He even, and you'll like this from this morning, he even would make up songs to teach them songs and poems. There's a whole book of poems based on his teaching, and he's got a great song, which is, sounds comical, sing a song of six legs, a new phyletic stage. I won't sing the rest of it to you, because you really don't deserve that. But what that is, is actually, it's a vitriolic attack on, on someone who, who, who was saying that recapitulation was right. And the whole song and the poem is actually an in-depth taking apart of the idea of recapitulation. The interesting thing was, here he was, multimedia, he's using drawing, he's using poetry, and it wasn't really taken seriously. Gavin De Beer in the 1950s, after we knew a lot more about genetics, again wrote some very influential books, Embryos and Ancestors. Yet again, the idea of recapitulation just wouldn't go away. Even although these people throughout were saying, actually, it, 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 it doesn't work and it can't work. 
Um, I've been fascinated by this ever, ever since I was at university and heard about the, the, the whole idea of recapitulation. And I've been really fortunate here at Plymouth to have a, a team of colleagues, Simon Rundle, Ollie Tills, Manuela Trebano, and um, we've managed to look at the development of marine animals on a large scale. Because one of the big problems with looking at development is that you sit with a microscope and you look and you see what happens. Now, at best, a marine animal can develop for 17 days. So if you want to see everything that happens, that's 17 days in a cold room. You blink, you might miss something really vital. That's, that's, I mean, it's exciting for the first time, then it gets really dull when you've gone on to 200, 300 embryos. Here's a device which we have been putting together, and this is where technology has really helped us, where we can look at hundreds, literally more than 200 individuals, develop from egg, fertilized egg, right the way through to, to hatching marine animals. And we can actually start to, to look at what's happening some, almost simultaneously with these creatures, and we can go back and interrogate the visual record that's put together. And we can ask questions like, you know, okay, Garstang, he did his drawings, but if we, if we do this in a sort of seriously scientific way, where we, we say hundreds of individuals go away, we look at the development, do they all do the same thing? Do all species do the same sort of thing? Do any of them relive their, their evolutionary history? And so we've got this beautiful device to do this, and it was mainly Ollie Tills that put it together. And so let me just show you one of the records that we've got. This is for a little pond snail. What you're about to see in 30 seconds takes 17 days. And usually, if you wanted to see this, you would have to sit and watch it for 17 days. So I'm about to set it going. And what you'll see for the first couple of, um, the first couple of cell cleavages, that it, it splits into smaller and smaller cells, mummy controls. Mummy's genes actually are controlling that. There's a huge amount of maternal control. And then after that, it's over to the embryo and the environment interacting. It's not just the genes. Let's just watch it. 30 seconds. Two cell, four cell going through lots of different cells, it invaginates in itself, it's moving around quite a lot because it's speeded up, because it's 17 days. Here you have a thing that looks like a bit like a hippo, if you look at the right direction and close one eye. And you can see there's eye spots there. It's beginning to crawl around now. Yeah, it's looking at you. It's quite cute almost for a snail. <laughs> and finally, it's getting too big for the egg, and it will escape now. It's hatched. You've watched 17 days worth of development. Now, what happens if you do that and you look at that for lots of individuals and lots of different species? How much variation is there? Because if Heiko's idea is right, there should be little variation at the beginning and only much, much later on, perhaps even well after hatching, should you get any variability at all. And also, things should become more complex because you've got a very simple beginning because you're going through your evolutionary simple stage and it's more complex at the, at the end. It doesn't work out that way. Right, this is a snail. This is a, a, called a villager of a snail. This is what a, a snail looks like, one that lives in the shore, but actually, as a, as a small larval stage, it floats around in the water and swims around in the water. And it's got, it's got a shell, which is this sort of helmet shape and top. But notice underneath, there's le these little things which I'm going to just put on. You'll see them move. That's called a velum. This is a device which you only find in the larval stage. It's used for feeding, it's used for respiration, it's used for movement, it's used for all sorts of things. It's a key instrument in the success of this larval stage. But it disappears and is never seen again. You won't find adults with this velum. Here's a very complicated structure, which in no way is a reliving of the evolutionary history of this snail. This is something which is put right at the beginning of its life cycle and has evolved at the middle of its life cycle because it lives floating around in water not crawling around in a foot. And as a result of having that velum, because that's a huge surface area, what has a snail embryo got in common with Doctor Who? Nothing to do with the TARDIS. It has to do with having two hearts. You can see one near the middle, just off to the left-hand side, and one at the top as well. Here you have an embryonic animal which develops two hearts, one to power the velum, and the other to power the rest of the body. And when the velum disappears, the, one, the heart that's associated with the velum disappears as well. That's quite a complex set of circumstances which are going on at the very earliest stage of development. And none of that, I mean, you can't say ancestral creatures like this had two hearts. That's nonsense. 
And really, all we've been doing is putting the meat on a lot of Garstang's bones, if you can mix those metaphors, and showing that these animals do not relive their, their evolutionary history. There's novelty there, and there's complexity there, even at the earliest parts of development. This has also been shown for, for, for vertebrates as well, now animals with backbones. One of the other things that, that we, we did was said, well, if you look at the, the different species and you compare them, these are freshwater snails, and you look at the way they put themselves together, do they always put themselves together in the same way? Because if recapitulation is right, it should always be one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, whatever, one, two, three, four, five. Do we get that? Well, here's four snails which are all closely related to one another, freshwater snails. The top one, Limnia, Limnia stagnalis, develops its eyes, and then the control for the main body muscles can, um, starts, and then it starts crawling, it develops a foot, and that foot is used for crawling. Radix baltica, very similar to, it almost had the same name until fairly recently. And if we look at that, well, it does the same. Oh, recapitulation. Radix auricularia, well, it's got the same first name, Radix, different second name. Here, the body flexing starts well before the eyes and then you get the crawling. So it's swapped round, like swapping modules round, a bit like in Jenga, taking some bits out the bottom and putting them a bit further up, but doing it successfully. And then FISA is different altogether. You've got crawling. It crawls long before it's got the main movements within its body and before it has eyes. Now, these are only three things that I'm presenting here. We've actually looked at 17 across 13 species and more. And really, it's quite a complex picture. But the complex picture says these animals are not recapitulating. They're not doing things in the same order as their evolutionary history. First of all, they're not actually reliving their history. But the history they are reliving, they don't all do it in the same way. Again, Mike Richardson, who's in Leiden, has done this for, for vertebrates, animals with backbones like fish. And it turns out there is more ways of putting a fish together than you would ever imagine. That's between species. Even within a species, one of the things that we're finding is that you can have animals which are under identical conditions, individuals of the same species, and they put themselves together in different ways very early in development. There's a lot of latitude, a lot of plasticity there. And if you put them under something like a stress, and what we've got here is this, this littorine obtuseta. If any of you want to see them, they're quite cute. They're on the shore, they're li living on seaweed. The nice thing from our point of view is they lay an egg and they undergo the whole of development inside the egg. They don't go and swim around the ocean, they just stay in the egg. They still develop a little bit of a velum, but totally different way of living. So it means you can visualize them the whole time. And if you put them under hypoxia, which is low oxygen, not only do they take longer to develop, but they actually develop in a different way. They put themselves together differently. And so this idea that during early development, you can't change anything and you can only add something at the end, just doesn't work with these snails. It doesn't work with crustaceans, things like lob lobsters and crabs. It doesn't work with annelid worms, little things like ragworm. And so from a marine biological point of view, the theory of recapitulation just doesn't work. And so, the idea that recapitulation is the thing should be changed. In the 1880s, there was evidence against it. 1920s, 1950s, and the stuff that we've been doing, stuff that Mike Richards has been doing. You'd have thought that would have been enough to put the death knell on this theory. And yet, within the last four or five years, we're finding people, are, other biologists, are now talking about recapitulation again. And here's an idea which is so attractive that it just won't go away. Evolution does play Jenga. It can pull the bits from the bottom and put them in different places. In fact, it turns out that that may be, may be one of the main ways that evolution actually occurs, by taking bits from one place and moving it in time and space to another place as well. And yet, the whole notion of recapitulation has re-emerged again in the scientific literature. So the question is, do human embryos have gills? No, they don't, because they don't relive their evolutionary history. They're put together in a way that fits them for the environment that they're in. Does it matter? I mean, in one sense, you know, we get it with the students, <laughs> who cares? Well, in, in one way, some people care, people of a religious, or an atheistic disposition seem to care because this has been used as a battleground of science and faith. Humans have got gills, there must be evolution. Humans don't have gills, there's no evolution. 
No, this is about the way evolution works. It's not about whether it happens or not. It's about how it works. And so that whole debate is a little bit sterile. Does it matter? It matters for those of us who are doing science at the, at the, 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 sort of the workbench, because how does your science advance? Here we have a difference in thinking, not just an accretion of facts, but when Garstein drew up those pictures of the embryos, what he was actually saying was, this is a different way of thinking. Evolution does not work by just having lots and lots of stages and then you add bits on. Evolution can occur at any part of the life cycle. That's a fundamentally different way of thinking. That there, are, there is novelty. You don't just go from simplicity to complexity. There is novelty there as well. Different ways of thinking. And yet, the story, such a good story, we relive our evolutionary history. You can almost hear it. In fact, Fantasia, Walt Disney, told that story. <laughs> with amazing music. It's a very pervasive story. So how do you change people's minds? Because science, unfortunately, is not just building things up. Science is about taking ideas and turning them upside down and thinking about it and thinking in different ways. Science grows as much by revolution as it does by adding things on. How do you get people to change their minds on things is just as important as what have you actually discovered. That's why it matters. Thank you.